Hello everyone and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm here to, together with Dr. Costa Nicolopoulos, Dr. Jonathan Cochrane, Dr. Ludwig Hansen and Dr. Peter Fairburn. Uh, we'll be doing having a discussion on immediate implant placements. We've already had a lot of good questions in which we'll be going through but if you have any live questions you'd like to ask just add them to the question box on the right hand side. Um, unfortunately due to the amount of people attending we will have to mute everyone um, but we'll get started anyway. So the first question was from Dr. Abbas Mohammed. How does immediate imp how does immediate loading affect bone remodeling? I'll start off with uh, you, Peter. Well, actually, this is probably a, a question for the greatest man I, I know in, in immediate loading and, and immediate placement, and that's that's Costa. Costa is uh, what he's been doing is has amazed me. I, I you know every time I go and see the setup he has and the the situation it's it's incredible so um you know we, we've known this for a long time about uh earlier loading and i think the researcher sasaki in jomi 2013 when he first worked at by just placing an implant you upregulate the bone uh, uh, metabolism this bone metabolism then falls away after a few days so if you load it earlier it then upregulates the bone um, and metabolism. So it's not about um, a, a remodeling in a, in a way, but it's putting it into function earlier and it's stimulating the, the host cells to, uh, you know, regenerate bone. And, uh, and, and that's why I'm really impressed with what Cost is doing because he takes that just to another level further on. Uh, so Costa, I think you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yes, certainly uh, loading the implant and um, functionally stimulating the bone is the way to go. However, people like uh, Bransky, uh, Schmuckler Moncler and, uh, and a number of other world-known researchers have shown that provided the threshold, which is somewhere between 50 and 150 microns micro movement provided the micro movement of the implant doesn't exceed that threshold let's call it 100 microns uh, then the bone will be stimulated and the bone will respond positively uh, and um, will uh, become into a bone building we'll go into a bone building phase which is very good for osseointegration if however this micro movement of immediate loading goes above the threshold which is over let's say 100 microns then instead of bone building we get bone breakdown in other words the osteoclasts take over so yes immediate loading is good provided we have the right primary stability, which we measure two ways, either by insertion torque value with our torque wrench or with um, resonance frequency like the Ostel Mentor. So a guy like Paolo Trisi, who is uh, considered one of the world authorities on primary stability, his research shows that provided the IHQ value is greater than 68, and the insertion torque value, which is what we measure with our torque wrench, is over uh, 45 newton centimeters. If you've got those two parameters, then you've got enough primary stability not to exceed that um, micro movement threshold. And then the um, effect on bone remodeling is positive and you'll get osseointegration. So, yes, it's good to load implants provided we don't subject those implants to an unacceptable micro movement which let's say is over 100 microns the research says between 50 and 150 and remember uh, 100 microns is 0.1 of a millimeter because a thousand microns is one millimeter so we don't want more than 0.1 of a millimeter movement. If we have more than that, the thing's not going to integrate 
and the effect will be bad on remodeling. Do you, do you know, Rick and Johnny, do you guys feel about this? Because there's a lot more immediate loading going on at the moment. You know, we went through a big phase of immediate placement, immediate loading a few years ago, but I think implant design like inverter um, has has improved the number of cases we immediately load. Um, what do you guys think about it, Ludwig? Uh, well, I uh, totally agree with the Costa. Uh, uh, there is a lot of more, for my personal experience, I do more and more uh, immediate loading and I can also load the implants with the permanent uh, prosthetics just after one week or two weeks. So this is also, if you have the right tools, you can for sure go with the, with the permanent uh, uh, and final restoration. But um, another thing I was thinking about is the bundle bone. Uh, there was a thought uh, a few years ago that if you place the implant, you will keep the bundle bone in place. But this is not true. We will lose the bundle bone in all cases, uh, even if you do the middle, immediate loading. Yeah, the, the whole concept of bundle bone, then brings in PET and, and, and you know, a whole lot of other areas. But uh, what are your thoughts, Johnny? Um, so I don't do immediate loading on single implants at the moment. I'm still a bit more conservative with those, leave them be. But for the full arches and where I can splint the implants, definitely uh, I'm immediate loading. And I do find anecdotally with the ethos, it does seem to upregulate into a, let's say, more ossified, harder, more dense type of bone um, if you're loading or if you place the implant rather than just doing a socket preservation. So as you know from my cases, if I just place the ethos and wait three months and re-enter, it's usually quite mushy still. And then I place the implant and after a few months it really does ossify. But if I place the implant or load, when you go back in after a few months, it's it's really very different. And it seems to be, um, as you said, potentially stressing the bone um, and it just has much more ossification, which is, is fantastic to see, um, rather than, than just placing the graft material and letting the body do its job. Right, Thanks. I think that's probably answered. I don't know um, about if you've actually been to Dubai to same day, if if you want a, an interesting experience where cost is loading everything uh, with the temporary that afternoon after he's placed the surgery and the next week they all get their final restorations. And this is in every case, singles, bridges, cross arch, it's uh, zygomatics, it's, it's quite an experience and it, it really is a, an idea for the future, I think. So, so moving on to the next question. Yeah, let's move on to the next question, yeah. A uh, question from De Dr. Dennis Tan. Uh, for immediate implant cases, how do you get sta stability? I'll uh, pass this on to you first, Ludwig. Uh, I'm sorry I was interrupted here. Um, can Just you, uh, the, the question. The, for immediate implant cases, how do you get stability? Oh, oh uh, that's it's it's really dependent on the case, and uh, in sometimes you have uh, a lot of bone you can get the uh, get the screw into and and get the bite, but in some cases you get you have all really D five D six uh, class bone. And whatever you do, you cannot get good stability. So it's it's really uh, host dependent, uh, I would say. But um, and also, if you have the CBCT uh, scan, you can estimate the bone quality and the the hardness and so on. And you can also pick the right implant size to get, uh, for example, bicortical. Uh, stability. Um, so how how uh, actually it's it's really dependent on on the host. Uh, and uh, sometimes I get I use a longer implant. Sometimes I 
use wider threads and so on. So it's it's really uh, not easy to to explain. Um, I think this is another question. You got anything to add to that, Costa? Sorry, I think this is another one that falls into Costa's plate because Costa has had some unique uh, um, surgical techniques to get higher primary in some of the most unbelievably low quality bone cases I've seen. So, and uh, and and uh, it's just a skill that he, he's developed over doing so many implants. But it's it's quite a, it, again, it's extraordinary to see. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I agree a hundred percent with Ludwig. Uh, you got to get a feel of the bone while you're drilling. And depending on how soft or how hard the bone is, you can under prepare or you can use a wider implant or a bigger thread, etc. However, there's one more very, very important tool in our toolbox the last few years, which is called osseodensification. And with osseodensification, in, in other words, we run these specially designed drills called Versa drills counterclockwise in reverse with lots of irrigation. We can and we certainly are able to densify the bone. And by densifying the bone, you can convert, let's say, a D4 into a D3 and maybe even towards a D2 and get higher primary stability. So yes, you've got to combine various techniques, use a wider implant, uh, under prepare, use osseodensification. Osseodensification is a very important tool that's helped us in the last few years uh, to uh, achieve better primary stability. So that's the only extra thing I can add to what Ludwig said uh, is um, osseodensification, which more and more people are using now, versa osseodensification. And, and on, on that note, I must say that although ethos wasn't initially thought to be a biomaterial of choice with osseodensification, for example, for sinus lifts, for internal sinus lift, certainly it can be used. Ethos is a great material to use and responds very favorably to the versus system when you want to... Uh, to uh, cause a vertical osteodensification, which means to lift the sinus floor. And I'll show some, one or two examples later. Uh, if, if I think yeah. some questions are, are related there. Should we, because I, I know, Johnny, you're not doing, you know, that many besides cross arch. So maybe if we, a little bit like me, I've just been going back into immediate cases in, in a way and and stability, and again, implant design is is something that's changed and made it a lot easier. You know, I, I using any ridge at, at at a time. I know that I love those implants that are five millimeters, but they're only four millimeter body, and you can just under prepare massively, and you can get a lot of. And it's the same with uh, southern implants, Max, and you know, there's a lot of designs out there that you can actually get hard primary into situations you wouldn't in, in the past. And so, you know, we've seen a lot of that being used. Pete, I mean, sorry, Joe, should we go on to the next question? Yeah. Um, so a question here from Yuli Gertzberg. Can ethos be used in vertical, vertical augmentation when placing immediately? Do you want to start off with that, Peter? Yeah, this is quite a quite a tricky one because this is really case dependent. And and yes, on the maxilla, but don't try this on the mandible. Uh, it's it's I, I sort of use um, I try and go for vertical in, in a lot, especially my molars, by by often not placing them all the way in, just leaving one or two threads, and getting vertical. And I get great results with it. But again, it's very case dependent. It's it's a mm. very hard question that because expectation comes into play here and you've got to work within the parameters of what's biologically sound and predictable and so i, I would definitely 
stay away from this until you've got very good skills on the on on the on the um, on, on with with materials. Uh, uh, we've been seeing a lot more cage titanium cage cases coming through, but again, those are not necessarily immediate. And we've been seeing lots of really good results. And we'll we'll have a look at one of Ludwig's cases. I, th I think you've probably got it in there. And we, you know, later on about getting horizontal and a little bit of vertical. Hmm. But uh, what do you think of this, Costa? Same. Yes. Um, horizontal, uh, I think we can manage. Vertical is a demanding procedure. And uh, the cases that uh, I've seen uh, of yours, Peter, um, I think you've, you've got primary closure on all those cases that you've left out a couple of threads. You, you, yeah. you graft ethos around them, but you put a cover screw on or maybe a, a low profile healing cap and then you close over that you get primary closure is that am i correct in saying that yeah that's that's preferably the best way to get get vertical you know that's a requirement. To... if you're not going to get primary closure and you're going to do one stage surgery i don't think you can get a get any significant vertical um, augmentation yeah. yeah i think i think probably everyone you know a, again these are sort of skills and techniques you 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 kind of pick up with time and it's better to avoid until you actually start having real confidence in things yeah right should we move on to the next one joe yeah so here's a question from neil hoisier uh please could you cover the protocol or your protocol for immediate implant placement into the molar site um i'll pass this one to you ludwig all right okay i can actually show a case if you want to uh, see this yeah i'll share um, your screen now let's do that. and then costa i think has probably got a case somewhere as well so you know should we share share your screen Ludwig? yeah you can show show my screen can you yeah. see my screen now yeah, yeah. all right and here we are. Okay, so this is a step-by-step -step procedure uh, with a hopeless molar. We have a, a big uh, carious lesion and also forcation, and uh, we decided to extract these two. But basically, we don't have any infections, more or less, uh, a little bit of swelling around the distal root, but in this case uh, it was quite okay for immediate ins installation so we uh, extracted the tooth can you see this uh, and we prepared the site uh, with the probably with the denser drills um, uh, it's it's actually good to have the uh, also densification and you can spare the 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 bone that's left in in the forcation area we place the implant and i put the cover screw in this uh, you can actually put the implant uh, into the site uh, simultaneously as you use the ethos with a slightly wetter mix but in this case it's quite easy to uh, to use the big syringe of the ethos and just push it in. Uh, uh, so for the molars, I, I actually prefer to do this. And also the molars is uh, uh, one of the, the positions I use not uh, to raise a flap um, because we have the excess and we can pack the ethos into the, the site. So I used the cover screw uh, just uh, to avoid putting uh, the material inside the implant. And I pack everything very nicely. And you can see I overgrafted a little bit, but then after the setting time, I scrape uh, and uh, expose the implant again. So this is how I use the uh, for the immediate implant installation okay and sorry i want to 
And also I try to use the wide healing abutment. This is to get primary closure. And uh, sometimes if you get the good stability, you can actually make uh, individualized healing abutment with a temporary cylinder and you make it in, in composite. Uh, but for sure, that will take at least uh, 15 minutes to make to make uh, that kind of uh, healing uh, abutment. So in this case, I used the seven millimeter and uh, and five millimeter in height. And what about the the jumping space now? When we need the primary closure, so in this case i find it really suitable to use prf on top and i just put some prf in in the side of the uh, the healing abutment and then just a, a cross suture over it and that's that's perfect and you will have a very nice healing uh, soft tissue healing here so it's, if we uh, go... it's, it's interesting to see the the, the case here because yeah. um, I don't know if you have used, used the Cervico system by another yes, Greek. Yes, the Cervico, um, and uh, there are a lot of different uh, options in this. Uh, yeah. In this uh, that gets site. A nice, yeah. It gets a nice customized closure. And again, yeah. I'm, I haven't put anything together using, but we've been using more and more of Cervico and been yeah. getting really good results and and i think it's a it's a really clever design as well which helps you plan the placement into a better position as well yeah for sure and uh, and also with this uh, particularly system the anerage system there is now available um, uh, different sized uh, um, square uh, square and rectangular uh, healing abutments nowadays uh, so actually i want i want to uh, try those a little bit more now i think it's perfect with the with the immediate implant placement all right you can see also there's a small gap uh, but actually the healing was uh, very nice anyway and uh, the impression th this is just after 12 weeks and then you can see um, the final result. You can see also the the, the final uh, uh, the final crown. This is a lithium desilicate crown with a just a standard post. Uh, heal, uh, and uh, this is a very very nice uh, solution. And this is also after one year in function and you can also see the the bone level is is really nice so this is uh, how i normally do it uh, in the molar areas costa do you have uh, one of your cases with max and versa or not here i have a case uh, that i prepared uh, it's not a max case but it's a six millimeter diameter um, uh, immediate molar in an upper post molar site together with Versa. So uh, if you want me to show that, I think it well, would be quite. Let's have a look at that, you know, while 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 we on, and then we can. So if if we just switch over to Costa, and we can have a look at that case. Okay, I'll show you right now. There we go. Okay, so the patient, the, the, the case that I'm showing you is tooth number 16. Uh, can you see the? Can you see our screen? Yeah, just if you just enlarge it, and yeah, there yeah. you go. Okay, so we've got tooth number 16. You can see um, you can see the the problem uh, that tooth that tooth needs extraction. We have a relatively low uh, floor of the sinus. And uh, we want to see if we can um, uh, do a sinus lift with uh, Versa and Ethos, with the denser burrs, which we call Versa and Ethos, 
and place an immediate implant and if possible load it immediately. So uh, we extract the tooth, uh, actually let's look at the CBCT, you can see some uh, bone loss uh, in relation to tooth number 16. And uh, once we extract the tooth, uh, we need to degranulate, uh, in this case, the, uh, the palatal root. It had uh, a lot of granulation tissue. So we degranulate that either with uh, Lucas curettes or the uh, Ethos degranulation burrs, those nice rough diamond burrs that um, are available from Ethos to degranulate these areas. And um, let me go back. I want to show you something that is very important and very interesting. Please have a look at the bone between the second premolar and the first molar. We have a fair amount of bone there, whereas between the first molar and the second molar, we actually don't have a lot of bone, and that is typical. I wasn't quite aware of this until uh, the, the MAX protocol from Southern brought it to my attention. Typically, the bone mesial to the first upper molar is more abundant than the, the bone distal. And for that reason, when you start your osteotomy, look at the bottom right. Can you see the starting point is mm. definitely um, far more mesial. And that's because you'd rather be closer to the premolar than to the second molar, because you don't want to violate that thin interradicular bone between the, 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 the two molars. And um, here we are drilling counterclockwise um, with lots of copious irrigation at 1,200 revs per minute. We're drilling counterclockwise uh, to densify the bone as well as to uh, lift the floor of the sinus. Um, with a three millimeter drill, we typically uh, save or um, do not perforate the um, the sinus membrane. So we, we, we enter the sinus with a three millimeter drill, but while we're doing that, the, the drill is collecting bone from the wall of the, um, of the osteotomy and is pushing it up vertically. So what you see here, you see little bone fragments or bone particles from the densification. We also typically like to use a silicone key. This is bite registration material. So that helps us to position our, uh, the direction of the, implant not too buckle not too palatal um, uh, th that's that's a guide a surgical guide that we use we then go, go to the four millimeter drill and now we have the five millimeter diameter drill and uh, typically when we lift get to the floor of the sinus we, we feel a, a vibration uh, there's a typical vibration that you feel while while you're trying to lift that dense cortical bone of the floor and then the vibration disappears and then you know you're through the floor. So what you see here on the right, um, this is actually the, the autograft that has been um, harvested from the walls over here and pushed up. So here is sinus membrane and this is actually bone that we've pushed up. And the reason you see sinus membrane in part of the uh, floor is because there was less bone there. If we go back to the scan, you'll see that the, the sinus floor was lower down here than it is here. And then we uh, we uh, use uh, ethos. Uh, let's see, if let's play, is this a video? Yes, let's see here. So we, we are now using this instrument, which I'll show you in a moment. It's like a, it's like a, a scoop to transfer the, uh, the ethos into the the osteotomy site. There it is, and uh, then we use our last drill. Um, we 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 gently plug it into place, or we don't exert a lot of force, and then we use the last drill at 150 revs per minute without irrigation. And every time we pack the sinus and use our drill, we lifting we actually lift the the membrane by uh, one millimeter. So if you want to get a five millimeter lift, you've got to pack the floor or rather pack the osteotomy five times. And each time with the last drill, 
at 150 revs per minute, we lift, um, we go in once and we don't enter more than one millimeter in, into the sinus. And then we get this picture here where we've kind of also compressed our ethos laterally and pushed up the ethos vertically. And um, now we're going to place our um, six millimeter diameter implant. I wonder why, what happened there. Maybe that looks the same thing. Uh, no. Okay, never mind. Then what, we, we placed our implant and we, we um, tighten the fixture mount, get a hundred and hundred Newton centimeter torque uh, uh, in this case. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, and uh, we actually used a um, a um, prototype torque wrench here that goes up to 250 newton centimeter, and we managed to read up to 200 newton centimeter. So what you see here on the X-ray is you see our ethos sinus lift. When you see a nice, well-defined kind of uh, dome-shaped um, lift. You know that you have uh, a nice lift without having perforated the, um, the membrane. And we've also compressed some uh, and packed some ethos into the, um, extra the, the, the uh, root sockets in this, this area here, as well as palately. Okay. And... Uh, because we had such great primary stability, we uh, take an open tray impression, and um, this is the immediate loading uh, with a full uh, contoured monolithic uh, zirconia screw retained tooth. And that is the end of this case. We, we sometimes use a, a max implant, which is either a seven, eight, seven or eight millimeter, and in rare occasions, nine millimeter diameter. But in principle, we go as uh, as narrow as possible and as wide as necessary. So in this case, it wasn't necessary to go to a wider implant than a six millimeter implant. So the max implants, yes, we do use them, the max of the seven, eight and nine millimeters, when we have such a wide extraction socket that we need to get uh, primary stability, then we use them. So this is our protocol for um, immediate molar in the upper jaw. And uh, that's the end of this case. Uh, Either. Yeah. And, and Johnny, are you using Versa yourself? Or uh, have no, you? not yet. I still like using my osteotomes and desk sinus lifts. Yeah, it's an interesting area, but it does take a lot longer. As Costa said, I was at a lecture of Costa's once, and Costa said, you want to do 200 of these and the easy ones before you start moving on. And, and this one millimeter at a time is very important because I learned that once. I try to go too much too fast and uh, it's something you've got to take time with um it's just a life lesson there you learn that should we go to the next question there uh, joe yeah we've actually had a live question which is relevant to what we're just discussing um so this is from adamas what is your strategy towards mesial leaned lower third molars you want to start that off, Peter? What do you mean with the removal? Yes, yeah. Yeah, um, well, um, we, we, we were having this debate on the same day implants WhatsApp site. And, uh, you know, we, I've, I've always try and get the tooth out, you know, even if it's involved very closely with the nerve. It's just something you, you do. And I know cost is the same. And we were debating whether coronectomies have a place yes we've been grafting with ethos do you need to know but i th what we've been seeing is is less probing distal to the sevens so uh you know we, we we'd like to publish something on that soon we've got it already um but i i'm a coronectomy costa you're not a big fan either no oh, no i don't i don't necessarily think it's a it's a bad thing it may very well be a good thing in selected cases I think it, there is a place for it, but generally I don't do coronectomies. Um, do I graft molar sites? 
uh, I'll be honest and I'll say, no, I don't. Uh, but um, it makes sense that maybe you get less distal pocketing if you do graft them. The question is, if you have a, a partly erupted, semi impacted tooth, uh, you need to get some primary closure or not, Peter? If you yeah, to you generally do, because once you've taken out the, uh, you know, the bone and the tooth, there's tend to be able to get more closure at the back there. You know, we, we never have a problem with closure there. Ludwig, are you doing a lot of what, eights or not really? <laughs> not, not really, actually. Yeah, no. you're more perio, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's go on to the next question, I think. Yeah? Joe's going to go and make coffee, I think. Uh, the next question is... <laughs> the next question is, how effective is ethos in horizontal augmentation? I'll uh, pass this on to you to start with, Johnny. Um, I find it, uh, as Costa alluded to earlier, very effective in um, building horizontally or buccal uh, or even lingual palatal. Um, the issue, as Peter also mentioned earlier, is you have to bear in mind the natural anatomy and if you're trying to push the envelope I've also found that when you've got strong muscle attachments uh, and there's movement of the graft whilst it's setting, uh, when you re-enter a site, it will not be as voluminous as you initially intended. So like all bone grafting materials, to have good bone formation, you have to carefully release the periosteum upon closure so that when the patient is in motion in the next few months of bone healing, the graft is not subject to muscle movements. If it is subject to muscle movements, the bone does not form as well as you would like. So yes, ethos is fantastic at augmentation and can be shown to be used in large cases where you might think you need a block graft. Uh, and I've posted a few cases historically showcasing this, um, but you have to make sure there's no muscle movement or micro movement, otherwise the graft will not set Yeah, I think those those are good words. I tell you what, two cases come to mind here, and uh, Ludwig's got one, and Costa's got the other one. Now it was Costa's first go at the suture technique. Do you have that in here? Because yes, that's a really it's really nice to have a look at that, and then we've got to look at Ludwig's. Ludwig, have you got your your titanium case? Yeah, I, I will bring it up. I will bring it up. All right. So we'll start off Costa. We'll start off with Costa using the Ainsworth sort of technique. It's an old technique from, uh, there was a paper by some Italians years ago, but it's been resurrected because we felt the materials actually suited. And I've, I've done quite a lot of them now and had great results. But uh, Costa started out with one and he did big looping uh, sutures. And I was thinking, well, but the results have been great. So um, if Costa, do you want to show that if Costa takes the screen again? Okay. Show my screen then. Okay, so basically what we want to use is a, a suture material called PDS, which is a, a, a synthetic polydiaxone uh, material that takes about six months to resorb and uh, we want to use it in the form of a tent as a space maintainer to keep the, uh, the overlying soft tissues away and to um, protect to an extent the, um, the, the ethos graft from the muscle pool. So this is our patient, a young chap uh, in his uh, early 20s. Um, he lost his two front teeth. The interesting thing is how he lost his two front teeth. He had an, he had an operation, an unrelated surgical procedure uh, by the NHS in the UK. And while he was recovering from the general anesthetic, for some reason, he fell out of his bed and uh, hit some obstacle which caused his two front teeth to, uh, to fall out. And it became a medical legal case and uh, the parents won. Uh, they won the case and um, 
they were reimbursed for a full uh, rehabilitation with grafting and implants. That's interesting. Uh, so let's now look at this case. He's got a, a significant buckle concavity here because a number of years have passed since his injury. So the bone has obviously been um, resorbed. So we have these concavities here. And what we want to do is uh, drill some uh, holes with a um, either the stabby lock drill or a uh, 1.5 millimeter diameter drill that we use in our implant set. So we drill four holes. There are the four holes. And we um, we cut the, the PDS uh, suture. It feels like nylon, by the way. It's like a nylon type of material. It's got that feel. We, um, we put the one end into the one hole, bend it over, and get the other end into the hole on the opposite side on the bottom in the form of a like a cross so it becomes like a like a tent or a cage we cut another piece so that we crisscross this and uh, create like a um, like the cage you see on the right hand side uh, this is a technique that uh, i saw uh, from uh, Peter. saw that from Peter. Uh, I'd never seen it before and it looked very interesting. So this was my first attempt at it. Uh, but as uh, I found out afterwards, it was uh, described by Michael Ainsworth. So that's interesting. So this is the um, result. And then we uh, pack our, um, our ethos, uh, a slightly wetter mix uh, for the first layer and then it's better to place a drier mix because it uh, kind of stays there where you want it and then you can apply a piece of gauze over that for a few minutes to uh, to help it set and dry so uh, so there's the um, second layer that we're now placing directly from the the wide ethos syringe and we apply it nicely under and over the um, the cage, mainly under the cage, but we do apply a little bit of the of the ethos over the cage. And of course, we never remove those sutures because they they resorb by themselves. They take apparently up to six months to uh, to resorb. So this is the the end result. We apply the, the gauze and keep the gauze there for a few minutes, like as in three minutes or so. Uh, to help the uh, ethos set and it also prevents um, blood gain all over the show and uh, and uh, making the, uh, the the ethos uh, wet okay so this is the gauze i think it's an important part of the uh, procedure is to keep it there for a few minutes not too much pressure just keep it there just to help it set and then we need uh, tension free closure and if we don't have a tension free closure we must create tension free closure either by doing a periosteal release incision um, periosteal uh, filleting or um, brushing technique i'm just going to add a little bit more ethos there and then we close the um, the uh, incision and uh, typically we like to add blue M gel uh, to um, allow for some slow oxygen release um, it's a, a material that's gaining popularity all over the the world uh, it uh, optimizes the soft tissue healing and then we tell the patient to apply this uh, gel three times a day for about a week and uh, this is um, the yellow is the pre-op and the post-op uh, for tooth number 11. And on the uh, blue side, it's tooth number 21. And uh, this is four months later. We placed, uh, typically we wait three months, but because of COVID, we uh, patient was only able to come back to us. Four months later, we um, 
placed implants, loaded them immediately. And uh, this is the picture six months later. And I think uh, very nice uh, result with the permanent teeth. And the, uh, the, the striking uh, thing here is, if you look at the red arrow, is the nice uh, uh, cortical um, buckle plate that has, that has developed around this area. So if you go from your pre-op to your post-op, you see nice corticalization of the uh, buckle plates. Uh, and that's the end of this case, uh, Peter. Yeah, thanks. Ludwig, have you got your, just to look at another way, and that's using uh, titanium meshes, and we've seen a number recently posted on Ethos case studies, but yours yeah. is really nice. So if we could share the, the screen with Ludwig quickly again. Thank you, Costa. Uh, it was good to see that case again. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I love to show this one. Uh, it's quite similar. Um, okay, let's have a look. Um, let me just take that away. Okay, let's have a look then. So this in the in this case, uh, I was not expecting this. Uh, I was expecting a quite simple uh, standard case uh, with this old lady. Uh, we had to remove this one and we uh, waited for four weeks of healing, maybe five in this case. Um, and let's go inside. And the x ray shows a, a quite large defect. Uh, that's a huge defect, actually. So let's open up the flap and what can we expect? a huge defect but also a, a root fracture can you see this root fracture over there so we had to extract that tooth again and wait for another uh, four to six weeks of healing and then we have another situation you can actually see from this this side can you see the huge, uh, the amount of bone that's missing? Um, we open up the flap and you can see actually uh, double, double dehesions in this case. So actually quite a lot of bone defect. But in this case, we pack uh, the place the implants and pack the ethos without any tenting sutures. In this case, we use the uh, titanium mesh instead just to hold everything in place. And I agree with the, the other speakers that they also, this is one of the keys uh, to get uh, gain, uh, good gain of, uh, of bone. So we place, actually we use the implant as a tenting pole and we screw retained this titanium mesh. And in my opinion, it might be better with the titanium mesh with the slightly bigger holes, um, just to hold everything still and uh, allow the, the blood supply to to penetrate, uh, to get access to the to the bone material. Um, but let's see um, how we can also. You can also see the deep uh, horizontal mattress suture. It goes in here, around everything, and back, and we tie it. Uh, back on this uh, position. This suture is the key actually for, for success to hold everything in place. This is the most important suture. And we can also see uh, the, the normal sutures around here. And uh, I also started to use the Blue M oxygen gel and we just wait for for oxygenation. 
And this is uh, the patient after 12 weeks of healing. You can actually see that it's, it's just so lovely, uh, this soft tissue. Uh, and the gain, we have a massive gain here. From this situation to this. So I'm very happy. And we make uh, a double uh, double omega flap, I call this, and just to push everything outside. So actually we can gain a little bit more soft tissue in this area. Just a simple technique. And now we'll just let it healing a little bit. And you can actually see when we go inside here, you can see the titanium mesh here, and this is without the mesh. Sometimes the ethos and the new bone sticks into the uh, soft tissue. It actually grows together. So when you when you open the flap, you have to be a little bit careful because sometimes it stuck into the soft tissue and you lift it up from the implant. But in this area where we have the, the titanium mesh, we, we don't need to open up a big flap. We only unscrew it and push it out. And actually this is the bone and this is the healing abutments here in place. And you can see the massive gain of new formed bone here. So we have, it's, it's actually designed to, to have two and a half millimeters of uh, horizontal bone, uh, just to be on the safe side. So from this situation to this situation, this is really nice result, I think. Bravo. But don't, actually you have a quite thick biotype you have the upper, the, the maxilla, the upper arch. This is actually a case selection that is good. If you have a thin biotype and in the lower uh, jaw, it's much, much more uh, difficult to, to gain this uh, amount of bone. So we put the implants and we have the nice bone. And after sufficient healing, we unscrew, measure the implant stability with the ISQ, and we scan with the scan bodies and make full anatomical zirconia crowns. But actually, I was not happy with this crown because the emergence profile on mm -hmm. tooth number one three was, was not really good. Uh, it was squeezing the bone. So I asked my technician, hey, you have to change everything. So we change it to a better profile. And now I'm happy also. And you can actually see the difference between these two crowns. It's actually just the technician switched the uh, the abutment digitally and just made a new crown the exact same shape and everything so this is uh, the advantage of scanning and uh, digital uh, dentistry thanks ludwig yeah that's that's an interesting one i mean with the abutments where there was one one of the ti of the titanium abutments and the other more stock abutment or from yeah maybe... it's it's uh, these are actually stock abutments and uh, the stock abutments uh, it's called easy post and yeah. you can actually see it's it's uh, plated with uh, with a little bit gold plated and and you can check your technician that they don't grind on this very fine uh, area this yeah so you, right. if, if a little bit polished in this area it's okay 
All right. Let's get on to the next question, Joe, because I suddenly realized that uh, we probably got quite a lot of questions still to get on. Yeah. Yeah. So moving on to the next question um, from Prof David Niao. Is ethos compatible with socket shielding technique when placing immediately? If you want to start off, Costa. Yes, uh, I, I definitely think it is. And I'll show a couple of cases, one uh, anterior and one posterior ethos and socket shield. Let's start with the anterior case. So this is a, um, a patient. Um, Can we share Costa's screen? Yeah, thanks. So we're talking about uh, tooth number uh, 11 with uh, some internal resorption. A uh, young lady, uh, relatively uh, uh, high smile line. So we want to um, uh, prevent any soft tissue loss, recession. So we do our socket shield. You can see the, um, the labial part of the root that we've left behind. We remove uh, the necessary part of the, to the tooth, the gutta perca, the apical part, etc., and we're left with this. Okay, so we um, doing our final drilling, and now we, uh, in a case like this, we we prefer to um, put the ethos in a in a in some type of dish. Mix uh, saline to the appropriate mix. We, we, we like to have a, a little bit of a thicker mix. We've got better control uh, of the material. So there's the, our, um, our ethos. And uh, we look, you see how it sticks to that, that instrument. That's what we want. We don't want it falling all over the show. So there it is. We take it. And we want to now transfer it between the shield and where the implant will be. In other words, in the gap. Let's see why well, this is not plain. Let's see. Can you see? Yeah, just click it again. Okay. And the instruments we use. And, and I really like these instruments, and that's why I've, I've made a point of putting them up with the necessary codes. Uh, we like to use this instrument on our left, which is the Hugh Freedy uh, instrument. And if you want to make a note of the um, product code, we like to use this plugger, and we also like to use this green plugger on the on the right by a German company called uh, um, Schwartz. It, it means sword. Uh, and uh, look how we're going to transfer this material in the area that is going to be where the gap is going to be between the shield, the socket shield, and the implant. So we place it there, and you see, the, the nice thing about this instrument is when you pull the instrument out, the ethos stays there. See that? You see how the ethos stayed there? By the way, uh, Peter, I want to I want to propose that Ethos brings out an Ethos instrument set yeah, because that's a even, good idea, Costa. yeah the, even this instrument that I showed is a bit too big for the job. We need to create an Ethos set. Okay, let's let's put our heads together and that's a that's a good idea. We'll, we can work on that. That's that's something I, I I've got a few ideas since you said it. Okay, so so we place our uh, then we can use the this is a periosteal reflector I think it's the uh, P9 or Trio and we kind of just compress it there. This is a very thin suction tip because I like to uh, I prefer to keep the ethos out of the actual osteotomy. We've already made our osteotomy here, and then we use our uh, the implant of choice. In this case, it's a, a sudden inverter, which is a body shift implant. It's got a wider apical end for better primary stability and a narrower coronal end to make space for the ethos and the socket shield. It's also got a 12 degree um, angle correction to allow for screw retention. 
So this is the, the right angle, but there is a 12 degree correction angle within the implant. We call that subcrestal angle correction. And that will give us, you see, that's where the screw access hole will, will come out. We're just tightening the fixture mount because we're getting some amazing torque, high primary stability here. So we're going to um, um, keep um, placing the implant because we need to make that black line that you see on the fixture mount, which is at the three millimeter um, distance from the implant, we, that has to disappear to allow for the biologic uh, zone or the soft tissue three to four millimeter um, required uh, thickness to allow for, as I said, the biologic zone as well as for the emergence profile, for running space for the emergence profile. And the dimple you see on the label uh, is the um, uh, thing that directs us we have to have that on the label. And you can see over 100 Newton centimeter primary stability. You can see that there's no movement there. So the dimple is on the label and the access hole is on the lingual. And this is our team in Dubai on that day. We've got good primary stability. You can see my muscles there. And <laughs> it's amazing how the prostodontist always seems to have more muscles. I don't know how that happens. And uh, we're gonna do a bit of bone milling here because we've, we've gone a little bit under the, um, the crest, mesial, and distal, and we need to get our prosthetic components and impression coping to fit in there. Uh, this is the head of the implant. This happens to be an external hexta implant. So you see the, um, the ethos on the label, and now we're going to put our healing abutment, and uh, we're going to take it off and try in our zirconia cylinder. We want to choose the appropriate dimension of zirconia. Uh, in other words, as wide as possible with uh, as little unsupported porcelain. Uh, we uh, take an impression here with an open tray impression uh, coping. Because you want to load this immediately. You see how the access hole now is on the lingual, on the singular of the tooth. And uh, dry the area very well. We like to use gauze to dry. Otherwise, if we use, if we spray air, it kind of sprays the blood all over the show. This is our uh, open tray impression. And uh, you can see very nicely, this is on the same day, this is about four hours later, you can see the the inverter implant, which has a wider apical and a narrow coronal, you can see the socket shield. There is the socket shield, the root membrane or socket shield, and that gap there has the ethos. That's where the ethos is. And uh, this is a few hours later uh, with the permanent tooth. And uh, what I want to do now is I want to go to a, uh, a posterior tooth, tooth number 16, failed endo. Uh, we remove the tooth. We, this is our socket shield. You can see the mesial buckle root there, distal buckle root there. You can see the, the uh, osteotomy, and we fill the gap with ethos. What you see here is ethos. And um, this is a max implant, which is a seven millimeter diameter southern implant, which they call max. Uh, it's, uh, I think, seven by 13 in this case. Um, we're using a zygomatic implant inserter to drive the implant to the desired depth. And again, here we're getting some very nice, good primary stability. And uh, this is the surgical guide that I showed earlier on. It's the um, bite registration material guide that we make before we extract the tooth. Tighten the fixture mount, make sure that it doesn't come loose because we want to apply some high torque and again 100 Newton centimeter primary stability. So of course with 100 Newton centimeter primary stability we can load these cases. Uh, we want to go a little bit deeper because the protocol for the max implants is we must be one to two millimeters below the buckle crest. 
Again, primary stability measurement, well over 100. There you go. And uh, we choose the appropriate zirconia cylinder, which the lab then trims down, packs porcelain over it, and in four hours gives us the permanent tooth. Impression. Open tray. This is an addition cured uh, monophase uh, silicone impression material. Open tray always. And uh, this is the permanent uh, tooth in place. I think in this case we then uh, changed uh, from the preformed, uh, pre sintered zirconia cylinder to a uh, full contoured. Uh, tooth, full contoured monolithic tooth. And here it is, this is the post-op. You can see part of the shield there, there it is there on the mesial. And uh, one year post-op, looks absolutely lovely, no, um, no falling in of the buccal uh, tissues, no buccal uh, uh, concavity, you can see nice support because of the uh, socket shield. And uh, this is the one year post-op uh, CBCT beautifully maintained uh, buccal uh, tissues. And this is where your ethos was, this area here. So this is your shield here, and this is your ethos, which has now one year later certainly turned over to bone. This buccal area here, that's where the gap was. And that's, that's the end uh, of these uh, two cases, Peter. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an, an, a nice, Case, um, I've, I've been doing some uh, socket shields recently, and and I, I find it you have to make this the shield a lot thinner. Yes. Than you yes. think, um, yes. and to the point that you can hardly see it on X-ray afterwards. Um, otherwise, it's difficult to get the space between the shield and and the implant without getting the implant too politely placed. But um, it's 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 a good concept, and you know we're doing a whole lot more work on it. Could we go to the next question, please, uh, Joe? Yeah. So this question is from someone, someone anonymous. Um, ethos has to be dried until it's set. However, once in contact with blood, it tends to soften and get displaced. How do we overcome this? I'll pass this to you first, Johnny. Um, this is always a learner's uh, issue. Um, and it is still an issue in bigger grafting cases that I come across now. Um, so the trick is if you know you're going to be raising a flap and you need to gain wide access, try and do your relieving of the periosteum at the beginning. So you're planning, um, trying to graft and then release the periosteum to make the flap fit over your enlarged volume. Of course, you're going to take longer for the bleeding to stop and for the ethos to dry out. Um, and being honest, I've been there. I've un underestimated the amount of time I need to dry my ethos, and it's become wet and claggy again. And of course, actually, it plays you. So, uh, me and my nurse have a bit of a joke where she's always saying, "John, you're very impatient," but unfortunately, you just have to take your time. Um, so, raise the flap, um, try and release the periosteum uh, as much as you need, or as you think you will need at the beginning. And also local anesthetic has adrenaline in, that's also a good vasoconstrictor that can help. But otherwise you've just got to be patient, compact it down. Uh, and typically I would ask my nurse to place a finger um, and I would go and write up some notes, then come back. And by then it's again, trying to be removed from the situation. But if you're looking at it, staring at it, then of course you're going to be impatient and want to crack on and suture up. And then the blood is going to seep back in uh, rapidly. So um, another trick I think Peter is also keen on is trying to apply a wet mixture first and a drier mix on top and that can also help because what you want is a nice chalky substance. You don't want the claggy uh, material that does wash out so you want a chalky uh, material before you start suturing up uh, otherwise you know, the ethos doesn't stay in the same volume as you want it to. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I was going to say we should probably show one of your socket graph case is later, maybe the one that was published, Johnny. Um, but there's a couple of questions first, and I, I'm just conscious of time. Um, yes, Ludwig. Yes. I, 
I totally agree uh, Johnny's uh, comments, but I also have, in some cases, when the patient has has high blood pressure, uh, when they have uh, some medications that they tend to bleed a little bit more, these cases are the most tricky ones. And I uh, start using uh, cyclocapronic acid uh, uh, and this this is uh, diluted in in uh, sterile saline, and we push this into the wound before we apply uh, ethos. Uh, and this tends to be much much uh, less uh, stress uh, when you when you uh, try to suture everything up. Uh, so this is in my opinion. A, a game changer, actually. And we don't mention a Pixaban. <laughs> no. Boy, I had some troubles with that. You know, yeah. uh, just this week, someone, you know, they don't haven't stopped bleeding for three days. The most small procedure. Yeah. Uh, Joe, could we do the next question? Yep. Because I know we've so, got a few. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Few questions left, and this is from Graham Blackbeard. Um, if you have autogenous bone available collected from the drills during site preparation, can you mix it with ethos, or should you not use it in a combination with ethos? If you want to start that off, Peter. Yes, well, obviously, um, you know, it is the gold standard, and yes, you you can mix you can mix it with ethos. It's no problem about doing that. I tend to not do it for a number of reasons. Uh, a, uh, everyone would say, oh, it's the autogenous uh, that's helped the bone regenerate. But it's also another factor is probably you can eliminate the osteoclastic phase. That's something I just sort of thought about. But in the over the years, I've always not mixed it and and had you know very good results. So. I've stuck to that, but it is the gold standard. And, and yes, mixing autogenous, especially from drills, um, a lot of people like doing that. So, uh, I mean, this is quite a controversial thing. So, it's just what I I do. So, what do you think, Costo? I've never I've never done it. Um, I, I think that, I think it would it won't do any harm. I think it'll do good, unless what you're saying about the uh, bone stimulating the osteoclasts? Yeah, because it possibly needs to be removed because effectively once the bone is taken off, it's effectively dead and it needs to be turned over. And mm -hmm. this could stimulate osteoclasts. I mean, again, there's not much research on this, so that's very anecdotal. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Johnny? So I've done it both ways. Most of the time, I would just remove it and put it to one side and just use pure ethos. Um, but sometimes recently, I have been taking or harvesting the bone from the flutes and just putting it around the implant first and re-entering. But because I'm covering it with ethos, to be honest, anecdotally, I've not seen much difference. As with Ludwig showing, you know, if you have a large ethos pack, when you re-enter, you typically just have an ethos build over the top. So, and you know, unless you're going to do a histopath and, and go digging, uh, which I'm not in a position to do. Um, I've not seen any anecdotal difference. So as Costa said, I don't think it could do any harm, but uh, but I'm not sure it's required either. What do you well, think, Ludwig? Well, I think it could be harmful if this it, it compromises the setting of the ethos. I would like to have a hard setting uh, of the material. And if you have a, quite a lot of the uh, blood and uh, a little bit of bone, it could actually uh, harm the setting process, I think. Uh, so I don't normally do that. And um, um, and actually, I don't see the benefits of it. I'd say there's a risk if there's pathology and obviously you're harvesting uh, bone, which is near pathology, then of course you wouldn't use it. Um, but if it's a fresh site, then, then that's the situation I'd potentially use it. Yeah, it does tend to um, bring a lot of concepts that we're contradicting a lot of uh, golden rules from the years gone by, but but that is effectively implant dentistry. It's a it's a fast moving. If um, 
we looked at what Costa is doing now a few years ago, I think people would be surprised. But in actual fact, it makes sense biologically and and uh, and it makes sense clinically as well. Anyway, Pete, I mean, Joe, I think let's get on to the next question. Yeah, uh, we're running out of time, so we've only got 15 minutes left. So I'm going to move to some of the uh, some of the live questions we've got through. Um, yeah. If we haven't got through your question, we will answer them afterwards via email. And if anyone has got any live questions I'd like to ask now, just type them in the question box on the right hand side. Um, so firstly, just going back to you, Ludwig, what you were saying about to stop the the, the bleeding. Um, can you just repeat your technique that you're using? Uh, the game changing well, technique. Um, uh, the technique is, as uh, Johnny said, uh, you have to make the uh, release incision uh, in the beginning of the operation, uh, and if you are, uh, if you don't. Uh, have any um, anesthetics left? Uh, if it starts to bleed, you can use the uh, tranhexamic acid. I think it's called in English. Tranexamic acid. Tranexamic yeah. acid. acid. So you dilute this with the saline, and then you compress the site for uh, one minute or two and then it stops bleeding and the site will be very nice uh, to handle. Yeah, thank you. So do you put it on a piece of gauze? You put the tranexemic acid on gauze and you compress it? Now actually you have uh, this, uh, you dilute the tablet uh, in, um, in some uh, st sterile saline and you let it uh, just dilute and then you take the gauze with this uh, the wetting goes uh, onto the site. Okay. By the way, you can also get it in a liquid form. You can get the tranexemic acid in a yeah. little break the bottle. It's for IV injection. You can use that as well. Very yeah, good. Yeah. For sure, because I think it's different in different countries. Um, I just got another question on top of that. Um, Ludwig, do you think, do you not think this could interrupt essential bleeding? into the graft? Yeah, it could be. I'm a little bit concerned about that. But uh, for today, I have not seen any uh, adverse uh, effects of it. Um, so moving it's, on. It's not, stopping, it's not stopping the bleeding totally, I mean. So yeah. it would start bleed again after a while. But in meanwhile, you can handle the ethos and Put the graft and uh, and suture uh, conveniently. Yeah, until you've got it closed. Yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, I think, it's it's non non issue. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so moving on to the next question. Um, how many n centimeters would you require require to load immediately? Um, I think you were talking about this, Costa. How many newton centimeters? Yes. Uh, the you know, it's interesting because if you go back like to 2013, there was a consensus in the uh, in, between Harvard and uh, a couple of other universities. And uh, there were guys there by uh, the name of H.P. Uh, Weber and Papa Spiridakos and a few other guys. And they were talking about 32 Newton centimeters, which is in today's standards, totally inadequate. Today's... Um, recommendations based on work done by Paolo Trisi and recently published in uh, 2018, if I'm not mistaken, in JOMI, is you need a minimum of 45 Newton centimeter as well as an ISQ value of 68. You need both of them. Personally, I think 45 Newton centimeter for a single implant is totally inadequate. You need close to 100 newton centimeter if you want to load a single implant. If you're loading an arch and you've got four, five, or six implants and they've each got 45 newton centimeter, I think that's okay. In other words, if you do cross arch stabilization and splinting. So the take home message is you need at least 45 newton centimeter as well as um, an, an ISQ value of 68. That's what the literature says. 
Mm. What I do in my practice, I don't measure ISQ. I measure insertion torque value with a torque wrench. And when I get 100, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> if I get 45, I'll accept that if it's part of a, of a cross arch. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, I've seen that. <laughs> Anyway, should do you guys want to make a comment, Johnny or Ludwig, on that, or should we move on to the next? But Costa, uh, are you not afraid of uh, pressure necrosis? No, 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 no definitely not, <laughs> Ludwig. Uh, the, the, again, Paolo Trissi did the best study, uh, where he, um, he used a large animal uh, model, sheep, uh, 110 newton centimeter on the one side of the mandible, 10 newton centimeter on the other side on the same mandible. Mm. Uh, histologically, no bone necrosis uh, in either of the two groups, even in dense cortical bone, because people are scared, okay, in, in trabecular bone, you can get away with it, but in dense cortical bone, you'll get bone necrosis. Paolo Trisi showed no bone necrosis. A guy by the name of uh, Philippe Alcayat, he did uh, a study as well, and he published it a few years ago, uh, again in Jomi. Uh, he went up to 176 newton centimeter primary stability, and he also showed no, no necrosis. Yeah. So uh, in my personal uh, uh, experience, and I, I mean, I'm doing it every day, and um, I, I don't see bone necrosis. Uh, I, actually, I actually agree. I, sometimes you can torque it uh, very high. Uh, but it, in my opinion, in my humble uh, opinion, uh, I think it it's depend where you get the uh, the pressure. If you get it in the apical area, it's not a problem. But if you have it in the dense cortical uh, non-vascularized area, it could be a little bit. So you have to know actually know your implant system very Correct. very nicely. And uh, if you are just thinking uh, about this concept, I don't think you will have any problem. I, I like we, what you say. Yeah. 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 Should we move on to the next question? Because it's just yeah. again time. Yeah. Um, so next question: In which circumstances would you not use ethos? I'll, I'll start with you, Johnny. I'm just trying to think. I use it for pretty much everything these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's certain cases which would uh, potentially require require a block bone graft, or you're looking for large vertical augmentations. Um, mm. But I'd use it for pretty much everything else. You know, we're talking sinus lifts, uh, lateral, crestal, um, large areas where you think you might need a block bone graft in the anterior or lower, um, so anterior maxilla or anterior mandibles. Um, but the only area where I would struggle to potentially get a good vertical would be the um, lower mandible. And I think that's due to the muscle attachments from the lingual and buccal aspects. Um, so I found that uh, it can work well in the tunnel technique um, when you've got bounded. So let's say you're trying to rebuild a six, so you've got the five and the seven. Yes, that tunnel technique can work to rebuild vertical and buccal. Um, but let's say you've got a free end saddle, then a lower five, six, seven region, I would struggle to personally get uh, much vertical lift with uh, ethos there so that's probably in my hands the only site I would struggle to to use the product unless uh, Peter's found a novel way of uh, using it there I'd be all ears <laughs> <laughs> yeah there, is, there are always limitations in life yeah, maybe the great thing about it is the more you learn the more you uh, and the more you try you know, you learn a lot through life, and uh, it's only when you get older you realise that you didn't really know that much when you were younger. So it's a, it's an exciting thing. Should we get get another question, Joe? Yeah, we had a question through for for Costa. Um, why do you prefer to use external hex over internal connections, even for single units? It's a long long answer this one. <laughs> it's not really related to ethos, but it's a it's an interesting one. Uh, basically, uh, I've been using external hex since 1991. Uh, I'm getting excellent results. Are we getting um, next to next to zero bone loss, especially 
in the last 10 years with the more modern external hex um, implants where the uh, tolerance the machining tolerance of these implants is so low that the parts fit on very well together the the, com the prosthetic components and the the hex the fit is excellent um, we hardly ever see screw loosening or screw fractures um, we have the added benefit of being able to uh, have 12 24 and 36 degree angle correction subcrestally within the implant which you can't get with an internal connection there's not enough titanium around the connection to allow for 24 or 36 degrees you can get 12 degree though with the internal um prosthodontically it's far more uh, versatile and it's a much more user-friendly uh, system um, we just don't have a problem with external hex uh, and uh, that's why we've we've maintained using it uh, together with the 12 24 and 36 degree angle correction there's one more reason why i use external hex i can insert an external hex implant with close to 200 and sometimes 250 newton centimeter insertion torque you can't do that with an internal connection it will flower open it will break open uh, you just can't do it but you can do it with an external connection and with a, for, a, for a person that wants to load everything um, we need that type of um, um, and we've uh, seen the muscles cluster no you've seen my muscles on <laughs> should we do, yeah, should we do another question? one or two more questions um, I think we've got time for one more question um, so we've got a question here what must the what must the consistency of ethos be when using it in a sinus lift procedure and what instruments you use placing the ethos inside the hole if you want to start that off ludwig yeah actually i uh, i use a kind uh, kind of desk uh, system from megagen and uh, the hole is just perfect for the ethos syringe so I uh, I lift this uh, the membrane and just put the ethos inside, and I pack it a little bit, and I try to keep it medium uh, soft, so I can put the implant inside uh, directly. Um, medium I I think medium is is the best, not too wet and not too dry. Have you got anything to add to that, Costa or Johnny? No, I, no. I, that, uh, unless unless you're doing it with a Versa system, then of course you don't open a lateral window. Yeah, I um I'd agree with Ludwig and have it as medium soft, uh, and that's either lateral or crestal. Um, personally, I don't use Versa, so I like using the osteotomes to slowly just pack it up. Um, Fortunately, I've not had a perforation to date, touch wood. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, because if it's a very soft material, then arguably it shouldn't have any sharp edges to perforate. And then um, what's nice is when you do place the implant, you just get this lovely puff uh, around your implant. So you know that it's completely enclosed by the soft ethos. And then, of course, uh, you know, it's going to just dry out over time. And then when you come back to take your periapical in three months, it's, it's a beautiful, hard uh, ethos build, as we know. Um, but no, I'd always say, slightly soft but fortunately the syringe does lend itself to to you know being placed into the window laterally quite nicely uh, and sometimes if you're placing a large implant crestally as well but i personally just use osteotomes to slowly uh, push it up thank you and uh, we've just got one more interesting question through uh from andrew fish um pre-lockdown he placed five inverters all immediates but not immediately loaded all sockets were pre-filled with a wet mix of ethos. Uh, no symptoms over lockdown, but four months later, they all failed. Um, there was no infection, but the mass granulation of tissue and loss of buccal plate. He just wants to get people's thoughts on why that might be. If you want to start off, Peter. Cool. I, I think somehow the buccal plates were um, fractured here and sequestrated to get that sort of loss of tissue. The only time I've ever seen that is um, 
in uh, in a situation where uh, there was sequestrated bone and it gets infected and you, you lose quite a lot and you get quite a, a, a heavy loss of tissue. But I, you know, I've actually got uh, 2K. I just did one recently that was prior to placing an implant and it sequestrated and I was staggered how much bone and there were just two loose bone chips in there. But that's that's unusual with uh, inverter because we haven't seen that with others. You know, I've only done X number, so I wouldn't say I'm a regular user. Um, I mean, it's I, I know the case that Andrew's talking about, and, and it is very hard for me to, you know, sometimes things happen in life that you can't, you, you've never seen yourself, so you, you can't equate to it. Um, but that's what I think is I think there was probably some uh, fracture of the buccal plate and sequestration of the bone. I, you know, it's so hard to say when you 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 can't actually say when you actually uh, haven't got all the details to hand and and things like that. So we we're using our imagination a little bit. Yeah. Has anybody got anything to add to that? Or? No. no. It's difficult uh -huh. to say without seeing the cases firsthand. Yeah, I've not had that many. Well, I mean, I've, I've seen the case, and even then, I. It looks as though there was some um, sort of some major sequestration of the bone. Uh, that's all. I don't know. We remember when we split ridges a lot, and then every now and again you would get one where it, it, it would just, you know, without if you don't, if whenever ridge splitting was popular many years ago, and every now and again you would get a case where you would come in and. Uh, and there would just be no buckle bone, you know, it would have sequestrated and lost the whole area and you'd be in, in, in such a mess. But, um, I, I mean, that's all I could think on this case. I just couldn't think out of why it, why it happened. Maybe something to do, the, the, maybe the ridge was a little thin and then the, the real compressive nature of the inverter and the expansion probably could have caused that to happen. that's all I can think but it's it's impossibly difficult to think yeah. no thank you for that um, I think we're going to call, call it a night there um, so thank you Costa Johnny Ludwig and Peter uh, some very interesting answers there and very interesting cases and thank you everyone for joining us this evening if we didn't get around to your question we will send an email out with the answers um, yeah. later on this week. Joe I'd like to personally thank you very much. and sorry Johnny I was meaning to get your case uh, but if anyone just looks on the Ethos uh, website, they can see his case that we published in in the EDI, and and it would actually be nice to get Ludwig to publish a case as well in the EDI and and Costa as we've spoken to Costa. But you know, guys, thanks a lot for for being here tonight. Um, it's it's amazing how this was completely unrehearsed and very impromptu, and it's amazing how we managed to you know we got everything to work well. I think. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank right. you. Right. Bye bye. We can uh, include Johnny's case in the follow up email as well with the questions. So we can share All that right. later. All right. Thank yeah. you very much. Thanks, Thank Johnny. You. Thank you. Thanks, Ludwig. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. bye. bye.